One day, back in fourth grade, I entered the classroom and heard whispering going around like wildfire. Apparently, my classmate had a breakthrough, and he had been telling everyone about a secret I never knew I had. I know Jeremy's secret, he said. Jeremy's not smart. Jeremy's not smart. He's careful. Yeah, yesterday during the Chinese test, I watched him. After taking the exam, he reviewed it like 10 times. And I wish I could say that rechecking 10 times was an exaggeration. <laughs> but there are definitely times when the impression of me being smart would be a lot more questionable than you might imagine. I have joined and represented the country in biology Olympiads and read several biology books cover to cover. But I freeze when my nine-year-old cousin asks me whether or not fishes blink. Now, before we proceed, if you could all just reach under your seats, you would find that there is nothing. Now, this is bad for me, because if it takes less than half a minute to lead the crowd to believe something, could I have possibly led people to believe that I was smart? What if my classmate was right? What if I wasn't really smart, just extremely careful? I've always been amused by how equal differences between certain numbers seem larger in some than in others. Take the pairs of numbers 46 and 47, and 99 and 100, for example. In both cases, we see an increment of 1. But taken at face value, the difference between 99 and 100 seems somewhat larger than the difference between 46 and 47. Now, I think we can all agree that there isn't much going on between 46 and 47. But there is, however, a lot at stake for 99. Just one point could make it a three-digit number, a perfect square, the complete perfect hundred that many of us seek in our lives. One point could mean little or large depending on the discriminatory power we attach to it. And among students, one of the striking manifestations of this can be seen in our grading system. Star sections and the hyper-grammarization of selected students make the selected few seem unreachable in the eyes of others, when in reality, the distance that separates them may just very well be a few good opportunities. The problem exists when the disparity between 99 and the oh-so-perfect hundred seems too wide to cross over. This creates an all-or-nothing divide that determines whether you made it or not, causing some people to feel like they fell short and others to feel like they can't live up to that perfect number. One day, I had a conversation with friends at university about being in the UP InterMed program one of the most selective, accelerated medical programs in the country. We talked about doubting our place in the program, as if we were outsiders who didn't belong there. And I've always thought of this an experience unique to myself. But as it turns out, this paradox is far more pervasive than I initially imagined. Eager to put a name to the feeling, I did my research and came across the imposter phenomenon a psychological struggle wherein you doubt your abilities over the belief that you have merely deceived people into thinking that you are more capable than you really are. Or in other words, I was pretty sus. I felt that it's only a matter of time before I slip up for everyone to realize that this, all of this, is all just one big act. Growing up, like everyone else, I looked up to the hundreds of the world. The top-notchers, the perfect scorers, the valedictorians, and the aces. And so as a young boy, I desperately wanted to know the secrets, the ABCs, the one, two, threes, to becoming one of them. So it was my turn to be thrust up a pedestal when I finally made it, at least to the younger version of me. I felt like a hundred. But mentally, I was just an insecure kid 
stuck at 99. My reputation preceded me. And I felt like a fake because I thought that people gave me more credit than I deserved. And even I struggled to keep up with this idealized version of me. To provide you with a visual, let me introduce you to the two Jeremys. This is Jeremy Ace. This photo right here was placed on the school newspaper with a caption that read, Persistent Pursuits. Jeremy Ace now tirelessly prepares for the digitalized International Biology Olympiad Challenge. On the other hand, this is a stolen photo after a long day at school, which I believe is a more truthful represent representation of a persistent, or rather, tireful pursuit. It felt as though I had been juggling these two different and disjoint versions of myself. And I'm just a few close calls away from being exposed as a fraud. I come from a family of artists. Art has always been the language we all spoke and understood. And it became a way through which our family bonded. And I was never exceptionally gifted in math and science. Heck, up until I was about nine, I thought that cats were female dogs. And I just couldn't wrap my head around the existence of male cats. But early on, my parents have taken an active role in fostering my study habits, particularly in the sciences. I can also still vividly remember how my mom used to remind me to double, triple, quadruple check my answers before dropping me off at school every single day without fail. Now, this went on until I became my own voice of recheck and second guessing that eventually progressed into their euphemisms, meticulousness and attention to detail. And so, like a double-edged sword, the imposter phenomenon is what motivated me to be wary of that one point, that one small detail that could easily snatch my blip, my 100 in a blip, one point that could catapult me back to 99 and expose me as less than perfect. People often get the impression that biology is simply rote memorization. Ultimately, biology is about connecting patterns and making sense of them. But for me to win Quizbees and reach higher levels of understanding, I first had to employ rather formulaic and methodical recall strategies, which seemingly diminishes the extra in extraordinary and becomes an average, achievable process. At its core, we perceive others' expectations of our nurture, of our abilities, as substantially inflated because the fruits of our nurture are often mistaken as gifts of nature. And so to compensate for the lack of a gift, I ought to work really hard. I keep an eye out for every little detail, careful so as to leave no stone unturned. Just like how my classmate caught me rechecking my exam 10 times. But if being really careful and working really hard are all you really need to become well, me, then are we really that special? Am I really extraordinary, as they say, or just extra in my efforts to maintain this facade? When my friends and I talk about the imposter phenomenon, we always end with a Band-Aid aphorism we tell ourselves so we can sleep better at night. Fake it till you make it. And to a certain extent, it is the reality. But there is one caveat. The imposter phenomenon tells us that it's only real if you make it. Fake it till you make it. And if you don't make it, you're a fake. Back in 10th grade, after a crumbling loss in the Philippine Biology Olympiad a year before, the ambition or pressure to make it the next time around so I won't get caught drove me to overwork and hustle every opportunity I can take. After a, year's, after a year of intense back-breaking preparation, sacrificing school breaks for revision, winning the Philippine Biology Olympiad was my big break. It. it opened doors to my International Olympiad stint and many other incredible opportunities that led to other incredible opportunities. And in this contest, one particularly 
Jeopardy question haunts me to this day. My make or break Neurobiology 250. The answer to which I knew only because I remember skimming over the term on my phone while riding a jeepney one afternoon. In my head, I only got lucky, and it was all a big fluke. And I wouldn't be here standing in front of you today if I had skipped the term prosopagnosia in my skimming of over thousands of pages, or if the right question had not been asked. Oddly enough, I carry this insecurity with me no matter how many times I've proven myself by winning again. In a nutshell, quite ironically, competence doubt drove me to feel compelled to achieve something significant and to overwork in order to prove myself, only to pin it all on luck and doubt my competence again. Allow me to present another case in point. I had served as an officer of the student council through all six years of high school. And by the time I was in 11th grade, I was poised to be the next president. But there was a problem. Rules of the game have changed, and the pandemic prompted the shift to an entirely online and remote mode. My candidacy was built on the fact that I was experienced. But the virtual arena was a whole new playing field. So if experience were the bullet to my gun, then how was I to fare in a gunfight with my own bare hands? It was a true test of leadership because there was no template for a remote pandemic student council leadership. And soon enough, I had to relearn everything I knew about leadership, from discovering new ways to communicate down to hosting talent shows online. In truth, I was just as clueless as anyone else on the team. But in the process, this competence doubt and the fear of failure ignited ambition or the need to succeed and set high expectations for myself so as not to get caught. To our surprise, by the end of the year, we exceeded our expectations, innovated the ways we conducted online projects and programs, and reached out to communities, transcended borders we never thought we'd cross. This ambition, however, is unsustainable and is but a part of the vicious cycle of the imposter phenomenon. But how can we break this cycle? First, it is imperative that we acknowledge that these illusions are often bloated and unreal. We need to acknowledge that there exists a mobile spectrum that people can climb, and as much as possible, adopt benchmarking tools that permit such a system, as opposed to rigid clustering. We can't discount the decimals the 99.1, the 99.789, to allow ourselves to be works in progress amid expectations. The truth is, humans are far too complex to be scrutinized under clear-cut black and white lenses, because life really is a messy shade of gray, and judging everyone by the same scale promotes unnecessary alienation. Such a cultural overhaul is no overnight work, and in the meantime, what we can control is our response to the systems in place. To not place our value on a number, but on the effort we put in, and to find purpose in the climb itself. Second, working hard is more sustainable than relying on a gift. It is important to develop a growth mindset and to acknowledge that we have the agency to grow and achieve what we want in as much as we have grown into who we are today, also through personal agency. Being careful and diligent instead of talented and gifted doesn't make you any less of who you are. And there's nothing wrong with following a formula, no matter if it's structured like a recipe with all the one, two, threes laid out. At its core, working towards a goal means that you care more about making it than just faking it. And that alone should be all you need to absolve you of the imposter guilt. Because a true imposter will be comfortable with deception. Lastly, the imposter phenomenon is still more popularly known as its misnomer, which you all might be more familiar with, imposter syndrome. It is, however, not medically recognized as a syndrome. And although research suggests that as much as 82% of people experience the imposter phenomenon, 
part of what makes it so difficult to talk about is the fear of being misunderstood and unrelatable. It's an enigma. But what if we start treating it as less of a pathology and more of a natural human feeling that it actually is? I came across the fascinating concept of evolutionary stable strategies, which are foolproof social behaviors that can persist over long periods of time. And upon learning about it, I made a very important realization. The imposter phenomenon could be an evolutionary stable strategy in that when faced with judgment from others, one strategy to reduce anxiety over perfectionism or the fear of failure may be to underestimate one's abilities and deceive oneself. What this means is that the imposter phenomenon could be a form of protection. This reveals an important perspective. What if we could see the imposter phenomenon as a common defense against a shared struggle? What if imposter, imposter phenomenon is a part of the human condition? What if imposterism is and has always been a part of humans that we cannot simply detach? What if the disconnection of the imposter phenomenon is truly what connects us all? Thank you.